I have three, uh, three notices here that I should like to read three requests. Kenneth Henry is asked to call home. Michael Stock is asked to call operator 18, 881-0630. Mr. Dwayne Dix uh, of Mound, or is it Dee Dee? I'm not <coughs> sure. Call home. Um, I think your folks are a little worried about you. <coughs> <coughs> The uh, name of Noam Chomsky is being heard more and more frequently and in broader and broader circles. At least I've heard it more and more frequently in recent months. When we discuss the theme for this year's uh, Nobel conference a year ago, his name was mentioned by several of the participants as a person we would surely want to get. Some weeks later, I was on a plane going to Chicago, and a graduate student from Indiana, I think it was, was reading a book. And I um, uh, got to glancing over at it, and when he put it down, I took it up, and it was by Noam Chomsky. And I picked up the um, Newsweek in August of this past summer and found that uh, the education editor felt called upon to devote practically two full pages to what he described as a controversy between B.F. Skinner of Harvard and Noam Chomsky of MIT. I think Dr. Chomsky may not agree with all of that article, <clears throat> and he might take exception even to that part of it which I shall read, but I think you may not after you have heard him. It refers to Dr. Chomsky as MIT's brilliant Noam Chomsky, who is something of a maverick a linguistic scientist, an impassioned liberal humanist, then goes on to say that he has developed into one of the world's foremost linguistic scientists, and some of his hypotheses about how people learn are so tantalizing that he's built up a considerable following which is challenging the traditionalist school of linguistics. Now, this may be sufficient to certify that we have indeed been fortunate to secure Dr. Chomsky's participation in this conference on communication and language. His talents and achievements have already been recognized by appointments and honors from major universities in this country, including Princeton, Harvard, Berkeley, the University of Chicago, the University of London, the latter two institutions from which he holds honorary doctorates and not least by his professorship at MIT. We look forward to hearing what he has to say on form and meaning in natural language. Dr. Chomsky. When we study human language, we are approaching what some might like to call the human essence, the distinctive qualities of mind that are, so far as we know, unique to man, and that are inseparable from any critical phase of human existence, personal or social. Hence the fascination of this study, and no less its frustration. The frustration arises from the fact that despite much progress, we remain as incapable as ever of coming to grips with the core problem of human language, which I take to be this. Having mastered a language, one is able to understand an indefinite number of expressions that are new to one's experience, that bear no simple physical resemblance, and are in no simple way analogous to the expressions that constitute one's linguistic experience. And one is able, with greater or less facility, 
to produce such expressions on an appropriate occasion, despite their novelty and independently of detectable stimulus configurations, to be understood by others who share this st uh, still quite mysterious ability. The normal use of language is in this sense a creative activity. This creative aspect of normal language use is one fundamental factor that distinguishes human language from any known system of animal communication, point to which I'll return. It's important to bear in mind that the creation of linguistic expressions that are novel but appropriate is the normal mode of language use. If some individual were to restrict himself largely to a definite set of linguistic patterns, to a set of habitual responses to stimulus configurations, or to what are called analogies in modern linguistics, in this case we would regard such a person as mentally defective, as more, more animal than human. He would immediately be set apart from normal humans by his inability to understand normal discourse by his inability to take part in it in the normal way, the normal way being innovative, free from control by external stimuli, but nevertheless appropriate to new and ever-changing situations. It's not a novel insight that human speech is distinguished by these qualities, though it is an insight that must be recaptured time and time again. With each advance in our understanding of the mechanisms of language, of thought, and of behavior, there almost inevitably comes a tendency to believe that we have found the key to understanding man's apparently unique uh, qualities of mind. Now these advances are real, but I think that an honest appraisal will show that these advances are very far from providing such a key. We do not understand, and for all we know, we may never come to understand, what makes it possible for a normal human intelligence to use language as an instrument for the free expression of thought and feeling, or for that matter, what qualities of mind are involved in the creative acts of intelligence that are characteristic and not at all unique and exceptional in a truly human existence. I think that this is a very important point to stress over and over again, not only for linguists and psychologists whose research centers on these issues, but in a sense, even more for those who hope to learn something useful in their own work and thinking from research into language and research into thought. It's particularly important that the limitations of understanding be clear to those who are involved in teaching in the universities and I think even more important in the schools. There are very strong pressures to make use of new educational technology and to design curriculum and teaching methods in the light of the latest scientific advances. In itself, this is not objectionable. It's important, nevertheless, to be alert and to remain alert to a very real danger, namely the danger that new knowledge and new technique will come to define the nature of what is taught and how it is taught instead of contributing to the realization of educational goals that are set on other grounds and in other terms. Let me be quite concrete. Technique, and in fact, in some sense, even technology is available for rapid and efficient inculcation of skilled behavior in language teaching and teaching of arithmetic and various other domains. And there is, consequently, a real temptation to reconstruct curriculum in the terms that are defined by the new technology and that are, in a sense, implicit in it. It's not too difficult to invent a rationale for this, making use of the concepts of controlling behavior, enhancing skills, and so on. Nor is it at all difficult to construct objective tests that are sure, absolutely sure, to demonstrate the effectiveness of such methods in reaching certain goals that are incorporated in the tests themselves. But successes of this sort will not demonstrate that an important educational goal has been achieved. They will not demonstrate that it is important to concentrate on developing skilled behavior in the student. And I think what little we know about human intelligence, and it is little, would at least suggest something quite different, namely that by diminishing the range and complexity of materials presented to the inquiring mind by attempting to set behavior in fixed patterns, these methods may actually harm and seriously distort the normal development of creative 
abilities about which we understand almost nothing. I don't want to dwell on the matter, and I'm sure that any of you will be able to find examples from your own experience. It's perfectly proper to try to exploit genuine advances in knowledge, and within some given field of study, it's inevitable and again quite proper that research should be directed by considerations of feasibility as well as by considerations of ultimate significance. But it's also highly likely, if not inevitable, that considerations of feasibility and considerations of significance will lead in divergent paths. And for those who wish to apply the achievements of one discipline to the problems of another, it's quite important to make clear the exact nature, not only of what has been achieved, but equally important, the limitations of what has been achieved. And I'm not sure that scientists in the psychological sciences have been fully responsible in meeting this requirement. I mentioned a moment ago that the creative aspect of normal use of language is not a new discovery. It, in fact, provides one important pillar for Descartes' theory of mind for his study of the limits of mechanical explanation. And this latter study, in turn, provides one crucial element in the construction of the anti-authoritarian social and political philosophy of the Enlightenment. And in fact, there were even some efforts to found a theory of artistic creativity in this, what I've called the creative aspect of language use, of normal language use. Schlegel, for example, argued that uh, in the late 18th, 19th century, that poetry has a unique, late 18th century, has a unique position among the arts, a fact illustrated, he claims, by the use of the term poetical to refer to the element of creative imagination in any artistic effort, as distinct, say, from the term musical, which would be used metaphorically to refer to a sensual element. And to explain this asymmetry, he observes that every mode of artistic expression makes use of a certain medium, and that the medium of poetry, namely language, is unique, in that language as an expression of the human mind, rather than a product of nature, is boundless in scope, and is constructed on the basis of a recursive principle that permits each creation to serve as the basis for a new creative act. That's roughly a paraphrase. Hence, the central position among the arts, he argues, of the art forms whose medium is language, hence the asymmetry in the metaphorical use of the term poetical as compared with the term musical. The belief that language, with its inherent creative aspect, is a unique human possession, this belief, of course, did not go unchallenged in classical discussion any more than it does today. For example, one expositor of Cartesian philosophy Antoine Legrand, lovely name, refers to the opinion, I now quote, to the opinion of some people of the East Indies who think that apes and baboons, which are with them in great numbers, are imbued with understanding, and that they can speak but will not for fear they should be employed and set to work. <laughs> it's an argument which would perhaps appeal to Milton Friedman. If there's any more serious argument in support of the claim that human language capacity is shared with other primates, then I'm unaware of it. And I should say the same about the claim that human language capacity is shared in any significant respect with other, any other organisms. And at this point, I would like to interpret the data that uh, Dr. Marler presented today in a slightly different fashion, really for two reasons. I won't dwell on this, but I just want to mention it. First, I think that it's true, as he said, that a number of interesting conclusions would follow from Charles Hockett's concepts of the design of language if those concepts were at all accurate. But I really don't think that they are. I don't think that Hockett's characterization of the form of language comes anywhere near capturing the basic characteristics of human language. Uh, and secondly, even when one limits oneself to those rather anemic properties and in my mind, far from essential ones that uh, Hockett refers to, even in that domain, I think one can see that basic and significant, not peripheral elements, are missing in any known system of animal communication. For example, Dr. Marla mentioned two of Hockett's principles, namely the 
property of discreteness of natural language, and the property of openness. When you combine the properties of discreteness and openness, then what results, simply from a formal point of view, is a denumerable infinity of linguistic expressions. Now, no, that's an immediate consequence of having a discrete system which is open. Now, no animal communication system shares this property of having a denumerable infinity of linguistic expressions, and this is very fundamental. Uh, there are communication systems which have a finite number of expressions and are discrete. There are animal systems which have an infinite number of, discretion, of, of uh, signals and are continuous. So it's not a matter of the limit, and human language happens to be in between, and being in between is very fundamental, as you can see by considering other systems. Let, let me make it very concrete, almost caricature it. A, a, a set of traffic signals, let's say, that you might study if you read a French driving manual, which says that a horizontal bar means one-way street and two vertical bars mean no parking or whatever it is. I've forgotten since the last time I was in Europe. But a set of such signals would be a finite signaling system that is discrete, certainly, and finite. And let's say a speedometer would be an infinite signaling system, which is in principle continuous to the extent that it makes sense of talking about any physical system as continuous. Now, there are animal systems which are like a set of traffic signals, and there are animal system communication systems which are like a speedometer. But human language is neither like a set of traffic signals nor like a speedometer. The bee dance, for example, is like a speedometer in the sense that uh, there is a finite number of, link of dimensions, you might say, each of which has a in principle, a continuous range of selections that can be made along it. Each selection denotes or identifies a corresponding point along some corresponding continuous physical dimension. So the faster the bee moves, the farther the nectar is, and so on and so forth. But that principle is basically the principle of the speedometer. And uh, the finite number of calls of some bird, let's say, is the principle of the set of traffic signals. And as long as a system is restricted it's not a restriction in, in number of signals, notice, because one of the systems is, in fact, continuous, larger than human language, if you like. But as long as a system is restricted to these two, if you want from a formal point of view, basically trivial principles, namely the principle of the speedometer and the principle of the set of traffic signals, then it fails to capture the qualities of human language, which follow from the discreteness and the openness. And this is no marginal defect. This means that precisely the central property of human language that makes it possible for it to serve in some totally incomprehensible way to us as an instrument of free thought and expression, that central quality is what is missing in any known system of communication. Now, even the most interesting comment I thought to, uh, in this respect that Dr. Marler made was about the experiments with the gesture system of apes. And I think it's, uh, I think there are two things I'd like to say about this. As he pointed out, these are very premature observations. But I think it's quite appropriate that people should study the gesture systems of apes, let's say, because I think that the qualities of animal communication systems that have been noted are really very similar in many ways to the gesture systems of humans. Gesture systems of humans also have these properties of the speedometer and the set of traffic signals, but gesture systems of humans are not at all, as far as anyone can see, related to, to human language, to the kind of communication that's characterized in human language. Secondly, if it turns out, and I'd be willing to wager almost anything that it's not going to turn out, if it turns out that the, uh, that the uh, chimpanzees that are being studied can string together linguistic expressions in the manner illustrated in the one anecdotal case, then I think still one has to be very, very careful. You see, you can take a very young child, let's say a 16-month-old child, who may string together a sequence of words but that doesn't mean that he's forming sentences. He may be forming what amounts to a sequence of sentences. And in fact, I thought it was striking that the one example that was mentioned was a case in which the sequence of words, signals, had what you might call an iconic relationship to the events described. Uh, it was something like the signal for, I'm even worse at imitating these than Dr. Marler is, so I won't even try, come give me key open door or something like that. Well, that's the sequence of events that are intended to occur, right? Now, you don't have anything like the principle of human language as long as the temporal sequence of signs 
has to correspond to the temporal sequence of events. That's another property like that of the speedometer. Excuse me. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt. There's a request that the group from Richfield <coughs> meet their buses immediately at the field house. The bus driver has specified that he must get on the road. I'm sorry. <laughs> I must say, I have to admire the courage of those of you who braved the weather today in any event. <laughs> or maybe the foolhardiness, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, let me just conclude with that remark then. I think one, even if it turns out, and as I say, I'm extremely skeptical that there will be some detectable behavior which does involve sequencing of expressions, I don't think that that's going to prove very much about the relationship of animal systems to human systems any more than a sequence of traffic signals, let's say, that corresponded to the sequence of instructions, drive down this street and then park the car and then you know, lock the door or something, and that preserved this iconic relation any, any, any more than such a sequence of traffic signals would, in some sense, capture the essential properties of human language. And uh, until some animal system succeeds in, until experimenters succeed in demonstrating that an animal system captures simultaneously the principles of openness and discreteness and exhibits the principles of creativity that underlie this, until that point, I, I really don't see too much. Uh, I, I don't think that the relationships, short of that, between animal and language, animal communication and human language, will be any closer than the relationship that might be described between human language and human gesture, let's say. And that relationship from a biological or evolutionary point of view is probably nil. I don't see any reason to suppose there to be any relationship. Now, all of this, I think, does really pose a problem to the evolutionist. And I think it's a problem that can't be swept under the rug. I don't see any, I have yet to see any serious suggestion as to how this very specific system of human language might have evolved from anything simpler. But that's a problem, and that problem I don't think is going to go away uh, very soon, if, if at all. I don't have any suggestion as to what the answer is. Uh, well, I was saying when I digressed that I don't think that there are any, to my mind, no serious languages, uh, serious arguments at the moment to suggest that, that animals share, uh, have in their behavior and their capacities anything closely resembling, significantly resembling, human language capacity. It seems to me that what evidence we do have does support the view that the ability to acquire and use language is a species-specific human capacity, that there are very deep and restrictive principles that determine the character of human language, and that I presume are rooted in the specific character of the human mind. Well, obviously, arguments bearing on any hypothesis of this sort can't be definitive or conclusive, but it does appear to me, nevertheless, that the evidence that can be amassed is not at all inconsiderable, even in the present stage of our knowledge. And I want to reiterate that that's slight in many respects. There are any number of questions that might lead one to undertake a study of language. Personally, I'm intrigued primarily by the possibility of learning something from the study of language that will bring to light inherent properties of the human mind. We cannot now say anything particularly informative about the normal creative use of language in itself, but I think we are slowly coming to understand the mechanisms that make possible this creative use of language, this use of language as an instrument of free thought and expression. And speaking again from a personal point of view, to me, the most interesting aspects of contemporary work in the study of language, and grammar in particular, are the attempts to formulate principles of organization of language, which it might very reasonably be proposed, are universal reflections of properties of mind. And along with this, the attempt to show that on this assumption, certain facts about particular languages can be explained. Viewed in this way, ling uh, linguistics, the study of language, is simply a part of human psychology, namely the field that seeks to determine the nature of human mental capacities and how they're put to use. Well, of course, many psychologists would reject a characterization of their 
feel in these terms. But I think that, that this reaction indicates a serious inadequacy in their conception of psychology rather than some sort of defect in the formulation itself. Well, whatever one may think about that, it seems to me that these are the proper terms in which to set the goals of contemporary linguistics and to study its achievements and its failings. I think it's now possible to make some fairly definite proposals about the organization of human language and to put them to empir empirical test. Such theories as, for example, the theory of transformational generative grammar, as it has been evolving along diverse and sometimes conflicting paths, has put forth such proposals. And there has been in the past few years some, I think, very productive and suggestive work that attempts to refine and construct these formulations, which are formulations of the processes and structures that underlie human language. And I'd like to say a couple of words about these proposals. The theory of grammar is concerned with the question, what is the nature of a person's knowledge of his language, the knowledge that makes it possible for him to use language in the normal creative fashion that I've described a moment ago. A person who knows a language has mastered a system of rules that assign sound and meaning in a definite way for an infinite class of possible sentences. Each language thus consists in part of a certain pairing of sound and meaning over an infinite domain. Of course, the person who knows the language has no consciousness of having mastered these rules, as he has no consciousness of putting them to use. Nor is there any reason to suppose that this knowledge of the rules of language can be brought to consciousness. Through introspection, a person may accumulate various kinds of evidence about the sound meaning relation that is determined by the rules of the language that he has mastered. But there's no reason to suppose that he can go much beyond this surface level of data so as to discover through introspection the underlying rules and principles that determine the relation of sound and meaning. Any more than there would be any reason to suspect that he should be able to introspect into the mechanisms that underlie his perception of physical objects in three-dimensional space, let's say. Rather, in both cases, to discover these rules and principles is a typical problem of science. One has a collection of data regarding, in this case, sound meaning relationships, correspondences, uh, data relating to the form and interpretation of linguistic expressions in various languages. And one can, on the basis of this, try to determine for each of these languages a system of rules that will account for such data. And more deep deeply, we can try to establish the principles that govern the formation of any such system for any human language. The system of rules that specifies the sound meaning relation for a given language can be called its grammar, or to use a more technical term, its generative grammar. Uh, to say that a grammar generates a certain set of structures is to say nothing more than that it specifies this set in a definite and precise fashion. And in this sense, we can say that the grammar generates an infinite set of formal objects, which we might call structural descriptions, each structural description being an abstract formal object that determines a particular sound, a particular meaning, and whatever formal properties and configurations serve to mediate the relation between sound and meaning. So for example, the grammar of English would generate structural descriptions for the sentences that I'm now speaking. Or to take a simpler case for the purposes of illustration, the grammar of English would generate a structural description for each of these sentences. I was going to use the blackboard, but I imagine you can't see it anyway, so I'll just repeat them when I need the examples. Consider the following two sentences. First, John is certain that Bill will leave. Second, John is certain to leave. John is certain that Bill will leave. John is certain to leave. Each of us has mastered and internally represented a system of grammar that assigns structural descriptions to these sentences. And we use this knowledge totally without awareness, in fact, without the possibility of awareness, when we produce these sentences or when we understand them as spoken and produced by others. What would the structural descriptions have to include in these cases? They would have to include, first of all, a phonetic representation, a characterization of the sound of the sentences, and also a specification of their meaning. 
In the case of these two examples, I repeat them again, John is certain that Bill will leave, John is certain to leave, the structural descriptions must convey, in particular, the following information. They have to indicate that in the, in the case of the first of these sentences, namely, John is certain that Bill will leave, what we're doing is attributing to John a certain psychological state, namely the state of being certain that Bill will leave. Whereas in the second of these sentences, namely, John is certain to leave, we're not attributing any psychological state at all to John. Rather, we're attributing a given logical property, namely the property of being certain, to a certain proposition, namely the proposition that John will leave. Despite the superficial similarity of form of these two sentences, the structural descriptions assigned to them, generated by the grammar, must indicate that their meanings are very different. Namely, one attributes a psychological state of a complex sort to John, and the other attributes a logical property to the proposition, to an abstract proposition, namely that John will leave. And this latter sentence might in fact be paraphrased in a very different form, say as the sentence that John will leave is certain, whereas for the first of the two sentences, there's no such paraphrase. In that paraphrase, the, what you might call the logical form of the sentence John is certain to leave is expressed one might say expressed more directly. So of these three sentences that I gave, namely, John is certain that Bill will leave, John is certain to leave, that uh, John will leave is certain, these three sentences, the grammatical relations in the second and the third, the logical form, if you like, are very similar, despite a very great difference in physical form, surface form, whereas the grammatical relations in the first two are very different despite the very great similarity in surface form, physical form. It's facts such as these, of which one can amass an enormous number of increasing complexity, it's facts such as these that provide a starting point for an investigation of the grammatical structure of English, and more generally for the investigation of the general properties of any human language. Well, to carry the discussion of these properties of language further, and let me add in connection with what I said before, that it's really only when we begin to look at these properties that we're beginning to specify the characteristics of human language. When one simply talks about openness and semanticity and so on and so forth, I think one is very far from characterizing essential properties of human language. So let me try to carry this discussion a little bit further. And to do so, I want to introduce another technical term, namely the term surface structure, which I'll use to refer to a representation of the phrases that constitute a linguistic expression and the types, the categories to which these phrases belong. So in, in using the same examples, in the sentence, John is certain that Bill will leave, the phrases of the surface structure will include the proposition that Bill will leave, full proposition, which is physically part of that sentence. It will include the noun phrases Bill and John, the verb phrases will leave and is certain that Bill will leave, and so on. In the second sentence, namely, John is certain to leave, the sentence which attributes a logical property to a proposition. In that case, the surface structure includes the verb phrases to leave and is certain to leave. But in this case, and that's what makes the case interesting, the surface structure includes no proposition of the form John will leave. There's no physical part of the sentence John is certain to leave that, ex that states, that expresses concretely the proposition John will leave, even though this proposition does form part of the meaning of the sentence John is certain to leave and does appear as a phrase in the surface structure of the paraphrase that I gave for it. In this sense, we can see, even from such extremely simple examples, that the surface structure does not necessarily provide an accurate indication of the structures and relations that determine the meaning of a sentence. In the case of the second sentence, John is certain to leave, the surface structure fails to indicate that the proposition John will leave is actually a constituent in a sense. It expresses a part of the meaning of the sentence. Although in the other two examples that I gave, the surface structure does happen to indicate rather closely the significantly the significant semantic relations. And this is a fundamental property of human language, that the physical form of the sentences, the breaking up of the sentence into its parts, the categorization of these parts, does not in general, except in the most trivial cases, uh, express the significant semantic relations. Already, this is a property that goes far beyond anything that's discussed in Hockett's list, but barely begins to deal with the real, uh, the real principles of formal organization of design of human language. 
Well, let me continue then by introducing a further technical term, namely the term deep structure, to refer to a representation of the phrases that play a more central role in the semantic interpretation of a sentence and that may or may not be represented in the surface structure. So in the case of the first and the third sentence that I gave, the deep structure might not be very different from the surface structure. Those are the two more or less simple cases. In the case of John is certain to leave, on the other hand, the deep stru structure will be very different from the surface structure in that it will include the proposition, John will leave, and the predicate is certain, which is attributed to this proposition, though nothing of the sort, I repeat again, nothing of the sort appears in the physical form of the sentence in the surface structure, only in the abstract mental representation of the sentence. And in general, apart from the simplest cases, the very simplest cases, the surface structures of sentences are very, very different from their deep structures. The grammar of English will generate for each sentence a deep structure, and it will contain rules showing how this deep structure, which expresses the semantically significant relations, how this deep structure is related to a surface structure. Another technical term, and this is the last one, the rules expressing the relation of deep and surface structure are the rules that are referred to in the current literature as grammatical transformations, which is the origin of the term transformational generative grammar. In addition to rules defining deep structures, surface structures, and the relation between them, the grammar of English contains further rules that relate these syntactic objects. Recall the syntactic object is a paired deep and surface structure which relate these to phonetic representations on the one hand and to representations of meaning on the other. A person who has acquired knowledge of English has internalized these rules and makes use of them when he understands or produces the sentences that I've just given as examples or an indefinite range of others. Again, only at this point are we beginning to say something real about the design of human language. Already it's beginning to get complicated, but of course we won't really specify the property, the design properties of human language. I would not do so unless I characterized the forms of these grammatical transformations, said what conditions they meet, what kinds of formal objects are deep and surface structures, why aren't they just arbitrary formal objects, and so on. It's by answering those questions that one would begin to study the design properties of human language. And of course, we've long since left behind us any even remote analogs to other communication systems though we're barely beginning to enter into the domain of design properties of human language. Now, obviously I can't try to give in any convincing way a real range of evidence in support of this approach, but let me just indicate the kind of data that does stand as evidence for it. One kind of evidence that's critical is the fact that certain properties, certain very interesting properties of English sentences can be explained directly in terms of the deep structures that are assigned to them. These deep structures, which remember are not necessarily represented, don't appear in the physical form of the sentence. And you can show this even from the very simple cases I've already given, to repeat again the sentences that John is certain that Bill will leave and John is certain to leave. Recall that in the case of the first, the deep structure and the surface structure are virtually identical, namely John is certain that Bill will leave. Whereas in the case of John is certain to leave, the deep structure and the surface structure are very different. Now observe another fact, namely, that in the case of the first sentence, John is certain that Bill will leave. In the case of that sentence, there's a corresponding noun phrase, nominal phrase, namely the phrase, John's certainty that Bill will leave. I could say, John's certainty that Bill will leave surprised me. But in the case of the second sentence, namely the sentence, John is certain to leave, there doesn't exist any corresponding nominal phrase. I can't say John's certainty to leave surprised me, meaning the fact that John was certain to leave surprised me. It's a perfectly intelligible sentence, but it's not well formed in English. There's some condition in English which makes it impossible to say John's certainty to leave surprised me, even though if somebody insisted on saying it, you'd know what he meant. So it's not a semantic constraint of any sort. In fact, there's no other way really to say that other than this impermissible way. Now this particular case is a special case of an extremely general property of English. If you think about other examples, you'll find dozens and dozens of others. The property is that nominal phrases exist corresponding to sentences that are very close in surface form to deep structure, but they don't exist 
corresponding to sentences that are very remote in surface form from deep structure. Thus, the sentence, John is certain that Bill will leave, does have a corresponding nominal phrase, namely John's certainty that Bill will leave, since it is virtually identical in deep and surface structure. But the sentence, John is certain to leave, being very different in deep and surface structure, does not correspond to a nominal phrase, John's certainty to leave. And this is a characteristic property, lots and lots of examples. Now, these notions of closeness and remoteness that I've used can, in fact, be made quite precise. I've used them very loosely, but you can make them precise. And when you have made them precise, you have an explanation for the fact that nominal expressions exist in certain cases, but not in others. Though were they to exist in these other cases, they would, in fact, be perfectly intelligible. The explanation, and this is the important point, the explanation for this very curious phenomenon turns on the notion of deep structure. In effect, it states that nominalizations exist cars that reflect the properties of deep structure. And as I say, there are many examples that illustrate this phenomenon. What is important in the present context is that it provides evidence in support of the view that deep structures, which are often very remote from the surface form and often quite abstract, it provides evidence that the, the explanation provides evidence that these deep structures exist and that they play a central role in the grammatical processes that we use in producing and understanding sentences. These facts then support the hypothesis that deep structures of a sort that I've given as examples and that are postulated in this theory, that these deep structures are real mental structures and that these deep structures, along with the transformational rules that relate them to surface structure and the rules uh, relating syntactic objects to sound and meaning, that these are, in fact, the rules that have been mastered by a person who's learned the language, that they constitute his knowledge of the language, that, are, that they are put to use when he speaks and understands the language. Well, I'm not trying to imply that one example supports the, you know, gives enough to justify the theory, but this is the kind of evidence that seems to me can be used to build a very powerful case in support of the claim that abstract deep, that abstract mental structures of this kind do exist and are fundamental to the use and understanding of language. These examples that illustrate the role of deep structure in determining meaning, and they show furthermore that even in very simple cases, this deep structure may be very remote from the surface form. There is a good deal of evidence indicating that the sound of a sentence, its phonetic form, is determined by its surface structure, and perhaps this alone, by principles of a very interesting and extremely intricate sort that I won't even try to discuss. From such evidence, I think it's fair to conclude that surface structure determines phonetic form, and that the grammatical relations that are represented in deep structure are those that determine meaning. And furthermore, as I've already noted, there are certain grammatical processes, for example, the process of nominalization, that can be stated, that can be formulated and described only in terms of these abstract deep structures. However, this situation is complicated significantly by the fact that a lot of evidence that's being brought forth now in the last year or two seems to indi indicate that surface structure, too, plays a role in determining what a sentence means. Well, this study, the study of this question, is one of the most controversial aspects of current work. And in my opinion, that's likely to be one of the most fruitful as well. I won't try to do anything systematic with it, but let me give you a couple of examples of the kind of questions that are, uh, that are provoking a lot of the current work into the relation of form and meaning. One simple example, reasonably simple example, is provided by the so-called perf present perfect aspect in English. For example, by such sentences as, as this one, John, say, suppose I say John has lived in Princeton. That quality of the aspect of the verb is called the present perfect aspect, as those who went to grammar school may remember. A very interesting and rarely noted feature of this aspect, almost never noted, and to my mind, never noted in classical grammar, is that when you use this aspect, when you say something like John has lived in Princeton, the usage of the sentence carries the presupposition that John is in fact alive. So it's perfectly proper for me to say I have lived in Princeton. But knowing that Einstein is dead 
it would not be proper for me to say Einstein has lived in Princeton. Rather, what I would say in that case is Einstein lived in Princeton. Well, there are plenty of complications, but this is roughly accurate as a first approximation, and you can think of other examples to support it. But think what happens when you consider active and passive forms. Suppose I know that John is dead and that Bill is alive. John is dead and Bill is alive. Then I can say Bill has often been visited by John, but I can't say John has often visited Bill. Rather, what I would say in that case is John often visited Bill. I can say, knowing what I do, except that it's false. I can say, I have been taught physics by Einstein, but I couldn't say, Einstein has taught me physics. Rather, I would say, Einstein taught me physics. Now, in general, active and passive forms are synonymous, and they have essentially the same deep structures and the same grammatical relations represented in these abstract mental objects. But in the cases that I've mentioned that involve this present perfect aspect, active and passive forms differ, strikingly, in the presuppositions that they express. To put it very simply, and in fact over simply, the presupposition is that the person who's denoted by the surface subject is alive. And in this respect, uh, the surface structure also contributes to the meaning of the sentence in that it's relevant to determining what is presupposed in the use of a sentence. These, incidentally, are the kinds of things that foreigners, even who have very good command of English, often make very curious mistakes about that are awfully hard to correct. Well, let's carry the matter a bit further. It gets even more complicated. Consider what happens if you have a conjoined subject, something and something. So given the fact that, let's, that Hillary is alive, and given the fact that Marco Polo is dead, it's proper to say Hillary has climbed Mount Everest. But it's not proper to say Marco Polo has climbed Mount Everest. Rather, what I'd say in that case is Marco Polo climbed Mount Everest. Again, I overlook certain subtleties and complications. And of course, the truth or falsity of the sentences is irrelevant. Clearly, I'm talking about the meaning. Well, but now consider the conjoined sentence. Marco Polo and Hillary, among others, have climbed Mount Everest. Notice that in this case, there's no express presupposition that Hillary is alive, that Marco Polo is alive. Just as there's no such presupposition in the sentence, Mount Everest has been climbed by Marco Polo, among others. Though if I say Marco Polo has climbed Everest, there is such a presupposition, hence the impropriety of the sentence, knowing what we know as a matter of fact. Notice further that the situation changes in a very complicated way when one shifts from the normal intonation, which I've been trying to preserve so far, to a, an intonation that introduces what's often called contrastive or expressive stress. Well, let me illustrate the complex effects of this shift in a simple case, and about the simplest case is a case that I can make up. Consider the sentence, the Yankees played the Red Sox in Boston, which I tried to say with normal intonation. With normal intonation, uh, the point of main stress, the point of highest pitch, would be the word Boston. So again, uh, the Yankees played the Red Sox in Boston. And this sentence might be an answer to such questions as, where did the Yankees play the Red Sox? Answer, in Boston. What did the Yankees do? They played the Red Sox in Boston. What happened? The Yankees played the Red Sox in Boston. That's in the case of normal intonation. The sentence could be an answer to any of those three questions perfectly properly. But consider what happens if I shift the point of maximal stress and highest pitch. Suppose that I say, shift it to Red Sox, and I say, the Yankees played the Red Sox in Boston. Now the sentence can only be the answer to the question, who did the Yankees play in Boston? Before, in normal intonation, it could be the answer to three questions. Now it can be the answer only to one. Uh, notice that the sentence presupposes, when I say the Yankees played the Red Sox in Boston, that sentence presupposes that the Yankees played someone in Boston. If there was no game at all, then it's improper, not just false, to say the Yankees played the Red Sox in Boston. In contrast, if there was no game at all, it is false, but not improper, to say the Yankees played the Red Sox in Boston with normal intonation. So contrastive stress carries a presupposition in a sense in which normal intonation does not. Though notice, to make it more complicated, that normal intonation also carries a presupposition, but in another sense of presupposition. 
So it would be quite improper to answer the question, who played the Red Sox in Boston, to answer that question by saying the Yankees played the Red Sox in Boston. If somebody says, who played the Red Sox in Boston, it's not right to answer the Yankees played the Red Sox in Boston with normal intonation. So there is a kind of presupposition even under the normal intonation, but it's a very different kind than under the contrastive stress. And it's not easy to separate these two kinds and say what they mean, incidentally. You might try it, uh, exercise for the reader. The same property of contrastive stress, and it's an interesting one, is shown in what are called the cleft sentence constructions. So consider this sentence. It was the Yankees who played the Red Sox in Boston. This has primary stress on Yankees, and it presupposes, notice, that someone played the Red Sox in Boston. The sentence is improper, not just false, if there was no game at all. If there was no game at all, I can't say it was the Yankees who played the Red Sox in Boston. Though if there was no game at all, I could say, falsely, the Yankees played the Red Sox in Boston with normal intonation. Uh, these phenomena have generally been overlooked. To my knowledge, they've been always overlooked, in fact, when the somatic role of contrastive stress has been noted. I don't know of any discussion of them in the entire literature. Well, to further illustrate the very intricate role of surface structure in determining meaning, consider such sentences as this one. Take the sentence, John is tall for a pygmy. <laughs> I try to say this with normal intonation. Maybe I fail, but I'm having the problems that Dr. Marler had in talking chimpanzee. <laughs> this sentence presupposes, the sentence, John is tall for a pygmy. This sentence presupposes that John is a pygmy, and it also presupposes that pygmies tend to be short. So given our knowledge of the Watusi, it would be anomalous to say John is tall for a Watusi because the wrong presuppositions are carried. But now consider what happens when you insert the word even in the sentence. Suppose I insert the word even before John, so that gives even John is tall for a pygmy. Again, the presupposition is that John is a pygmy and the pygmies are short. But consider now a different position of the word even. Consider the sentence, John is tall even for a pygmy. This presupposes that pygmies are tall and it's therefore a strange sentence, given our knowledge of the facts, as compared, say, to the sentence, John is tall even for a Watusi, which is perfectly all right. Now, the point is that the position of even in the sentence, John is tall for a pygmy, the position of even in that sentence determines the presupposition not only with respect to John, but with respect to the average height of pygmies. And that's a rather tricky matter if you consider the, the way in which the word even is related to the characterization of the average height of pygmies, non-existent characterization of it in that sentence. Nevertheless, that is a factor in the meaning, clearly. And of course, to complicate the matter further, the placement of the word even in a sentence is a matter of surface structure. You can see this from the fact that the word even can appear in association with phrases that don't have any representation at all at the level of deep structure. Consider the following sentence. John isn't certain to leave at 10. In fact, he isn't even certain to leave at all. Notice that here, the word even is associated with the phrase certain to leave, a phrase which, as I've noted before, doesn't at all appear at the level of deep structure. Hence, in this case as well, properties of the surface structure play a role, and a rather tricky and intricate role, in determining what's presupposed by a certain sentence. And recall again that there are two very different senses of presupposition that I illustrated but didn't explain and don't know how to explain in the case of contrastive stress. The role of surface structure in determining meaning is illustrated once again by a very complex and poorly understood phenomenon that I'll just give some examples of, namely the phenomenon of pronominalization. Suppose I say, each of the men hates his brothers. The word his in this sentence may refer to one of the men. Suppose, on the other hand, I say the men each hate his brothers. In this case, the word his must obviously refer to some other person who's not otherwise referred to in the sentence. But the evidence is very strong that the phrase each of the men and the phrase the men each derive from the same deep structure. Again, then we have a case in which the surface structure is playing a role in determining possibilities of co-reference. And it's also been noticed, but not explained how, that placement of stress plays an important role in determining pronominal reference. You can tell this from the following discourse. Suppose I say, John washed the car. I was afraid someone else would do it. 
What does this sentence imply? John washed the car. I was afraid someone else would do it. This implies that I had hoped that John would wash the car, and I'm happy that he did. But now consider the following. John washed the car. I was afraid someone else would do it. With stress on afraid, the sentence implies that I had hoped that John would not wash the car, and the reference of someone else, of course, shifts entirely in the two cases, in a way which is not very easy to explain if you start thinking through examples of this sort. There are lots of other examples that illustrate the role of surface structure in determining phenomenal reference, and the whole matter is at the moment pretty much up in a cloud. And in fact, to complicate matters still further, you can also show quite easily that deep structure too plays a role in determining phenomenal reference. Well, you can see that by thinking of simple sentences like these. Consider the sentence, John appeared to Bill to like him. John appeared to Bill to like him. Here, the pronoun him can refer to Bill, but it can't refer to John. That's uh, in John appeared to Bill to like him. But compare it with John appealed to Bill to like him. Here, the pronoun may refer to John, but not to Bill, just the opposite. So we can say John appealed to Mary to like him, but not John appeared to Mary to like him, where the him refers to John. On the other hand, we can say John appeared to Mary to like her, but we can't say John appealed to Mary to like her, where her refers to Mary. Similarly, in the sentence, John appealed to Bill to like himself, the himself refers to Bill, not to John. But in John appeared to Bill to like himself, it refers to John, not to Bill. Now, all these sentences are approximately the same in surface structure, and it's clearly the difference in deep structure that determines the phenomenal reference. So unfortunately, phenomenal reference depends on both deep and surface structure in ways which are not well understood. And a person who knows English has mastered a system of rules which somehow make use of the properties of deep and surface structure to determine phenomenal reference. Any of you who listened through those sentences and got the right answers, meaning by that the ones I got, uh, could have mastered such a system of rules. Of course, you can't discover these rules by introspection, and as I said, they're unknown to a large extent, although some of their properties are rather clear. Well, to summarize, the generative grammar of a language specifies an infinite set of structural descriptions, each of which contains a deep structure, a surface structure, a phonetic representation, a semantic representation, and other formal structures. The rules relating deep and surface structure, what I've called grammatical transformations, these have been investigated in some detail, and they're fairly well understood. The rules that relate surface structure and phonetic representation are also reasonably well understood. And it seems that both deep and surface structure enter into the determination of meaning. Deep structure, for example, provides the grammatical relations of predication, modification, and so on. On the other hand, it seems that matters of focus and presupposition, of topic and comment, of the scope of logical elements, phenomenal reference, other things of that sort, are in part at least determined by surface structure. The rules that relate syntactic structures deep end surface structures to representations of meaning, these rules are not at all well understood. And in fact, the notion of representation of meaning itself, the notion of semantic representation, is a highly controversial one. It's not at all clear that it's possible to distinguish sharply between the contribution of grammar to the determination of meaning and the contribution of what are sometimes called pragmatic considerations, questions of fact and belief, and there's a huge literature discussing this point. It's perhaps worth mention that the same is true even of the notion phonetic representation, representation of sound. The latter is one of the best established and least controversial notions of linguistic theory. But nevertheless, one can very sensibly raise the question whether or not the notion of phonetic representation is a legitimate abstraction. One may raise the question whether a deeper understanding of the use of language might not show that factors that go beyond grammatical structure enter into the determination of perceptual representation and also enter into the determination of physical form in an, in an inextricable fashion and can't be separated without distortion from the formal rules that interpret surface structure as phonetic form. I want to emphasize that up till now, the study of language has progressed on the basis of a certain abstraction. Namely, we abstract away from conditions of use of language and consider formal structures and the formal operations that relate them 
Among these formal structures are those that I've mentioned, syntax, the deep and surface structures, the phonetic and semantic representations, and so on, all things which we take to be certain formal objects which are related by formal operations. Now this process of abstraction is in itself in no way illegitimate, but it's very important to understand that it does express a certain point of view. It expresses a hypothesis about the nature of mind, which is by no means a priori obvious. It expresses, in fact, the working hypothesis that one can proceed with the study of knowledge of language, what's often called linguistic competence, in abstraction from the problems of how language is used. I think this working hypothesis has a good deal of justification. It's justified by the success that has been achieved when it's adopted. A great deal has, in fact, been learned about the mechanisms of language, I would say, about the nature of mind on the basis of this hypothesis. But one has to be aware that, in part at least, this approach to language is forced upon us, forced upon us simply by the fact that our concepts fail us when we try to study the use of language. When we try to study this, we're reduced to platitudes or to observations which may be individually interesting, but which do not lend themselves to systematic study by means of the intellectual tools that are presently available to us. On the other hand, we can bring to the study of formal structures and formal relations, to this study we can bring a wealth of experience and a wealth of understanding. Now it may be that at this point we are facing a conflict between significance and feasibility, a conflict of the sort that I mentioned earlier in this talk. We may be facing a case where we're studying the thing which we have the tools that we're able to study rather than the thing that ought to be studied. I don't personally believe that this is the case, but it's possible. I feel fairly confident, in other words, that the abstraction to the study of the formal mechanisms of language is appropriate. My confidence, again, arises to the extent that it exists. It arises from the fact that many rather elegant results have been achieved on the basis of this abstraction. Still, I think it is important to realize that caution is in order, and it may very well be that the next great advance in the study of language will require the forging of new intellectual tools that permit us to bring into consideration a variety of questions that so far have been cast into the waste bin of pragmatics, and quite properly, so that we could proceed to study questions that we do know how to formulate in an intelligible fashion. And these are questions having to do with formal structures and the relations between them. I would like to even go further and to say that the inability of modern psychology to come to grips with the problems of human intelligence is, I think, in part at least, a result of its unwillingness to undertake the study of abstract structures and mechanisms of mind. This approach to linguistic structure that I've been outlining repeat again, has a highly traditional flavor to it. I think it's no distortion to say that this approach makes precise a point of view that was inherent in the very important work of the 17th and 18th century, in particular the universal grammarians, and that was developed in various ways in rationalist and romantic philosophy of language and mind. This approach deviates in many ways from a more modern and, in my opinion, quite erroneous conception that knowledge of language can be accounted for as a system of habits or in terms of stimulus-response connections, principles of analogy and generalization, and the other notions that have been explored at length in 20th century linguistics and psychology, and that I think can be traced back in large part to traditional empiricist speculation about human intelligence. I think the fatal inadequacy of all such approaches results from their unwillingness to undertake the abstract study of linguistic competence. Had the physical sciences limited themselves by similar methodological strictures, we would still be in the era of Babylonian astronomy. Now, one traditional concept that has reemerged in current work, a concept which I've already mentioned, is the concept universal grammar. And I want to finish up by just saying a word about this topic. There are two kinds of evidence suggesting that deep-seated formal conditions are satisfied by the grammars of all languages. I think that a more persuasive kind of evidence bearing on universal grammar is provided by the study of a single language. Now, it may at first seem paradoxical that the intensive study of a single language should provide evidence regarding universal grammar, 
But I think a little thought about the matter shows that it's a very natural consequence. To see this, consider the problem of determining, suppose that you're a scientist who's trying to determine the mental capacities that make language acquisition possible. Now, I've said that the study of grammar, that is, language competence, this involves an abstraction from language use. The question that I'm now putting before you, namely the study of the mental capacities that make acquisition of grammar possible, this involves a further second-order abstraction. So people who were repelled by the first abstraction will be lost with the second one. But not being repelled by the first, I don't see anything wrong with the second. I don't see any fault in this second-order abstraction. In fact, again, to repeat, the physical sciences would regard this amount of abstraction as trivially close to the phenomenal data. It's only the behavioral sciences that have this curious refusal to deal with their problems in a normal intellectual fashion. <laughs> we may formulate the problem of determining the intrinsic capacities of a device of unknown properties that accepts as input the kind of data that's available to the child learning his first language and produces as output the generative grammar of that language. The output in this case is the internally represented grammar, mastery of which constitutes knowledge of the language. Suppose now that we undertake to study the intrinsic structure of a language acquisition device that takes data as input and gives a representation of the knowledge of the child as its, in quotes, output. Suppose that we undertake to study this without any dogma or presupposition about the nature of mind. I think if we do this, we arrive at some conclusions which obviously can only be tentative but which still seem to me very significant and reasonably well-founded. Notice that we have to attribute to this acquisition device, we have to attribute to it enough structure so that the grammar can be constructed by the device within the empirically given constraints of time and available data. And we must also meet the empirical condition that different speakers of the same language, who will, of course, have somewhat different experience and training, Nevertheless, we'll acquire grammars that re are remarkably similar, as we can determine from the ease with which they communicate, and as we can determine from the correspondences among them in the interpretation of new sentences. Now, it's immediately obvious that the data available to the child, the input to this abstract device, this is extremely limited. For example, it's bounded by the number of seconds in his lifetime, which is a trivially small number, as compared with the range of sentences that he can immediately understand and that he can produce in the appropriate manner. You can do some calculations if you like. Having some knowledge of the characteristics of the acquired grammars, having some knowledge of the limitations on the available data, we can go ahead to formulate certain, I think, reasonable and very strong empirical hypotheses regarding the internal structure of this language acquisition device, the device that constructs the postulated grammars from the given data. When we study this question in detail, we're led, I think, to attribute to this device a very rich system of constraints on the form of a possible grammar. Otherwise, it's quite impossible to explain how children come to construct grammars of the kind that do seem empirically adequate and to do so under the given conditions of time and access to data. But suppose we next make the assumption that children are not genetically predisposed to learn one rather than another language, which is a perfectly reasonable assumption, of course. Then the conclusions that we reach regarding the language acquisition device are immediately conclusions regarding universal grammar. These conclusions can be falsified by showing that they fail to account for the construction of other languages, and these conclusions are further verified if they serve to explain facts about other languages. But the main insight into the device, and hence into universal grammar, given the assumption of genetic neutrality, the main evidence does come from the intensive study of a single language. Now, I think this line of argument is very reasonable in a general way, and when it's pursued in detail, it leads to very strong empirical hypotheses concerning universal grammar, even from the study of a particular language. That's a line of approach which was not undertaken in the traditional study of universal grammar, and I think mistakenly so, because it's the line of investigation that is, in my view, most fruitful and promising. Well, I've so far I have discussed an approach to the study of language that takes this study to be a branch of theoretical human psychology. The goal of this study is to exhibit and to clarify the mental capacities 
that make it possible for a human to learn and use a language. As far as we know, these capacities are unique to man. I see no significant analog in any other organism. If the conclusions of this research are anywhere near correct, then humans must be endowed with a very rich and a very explicit set of mental attributes that determine a specific form of grammar, a specific form of language, on the basis of very slight and, in fact, rather degenerate data. Furthermore, we see that they, observe, they, we, that they make use of the mentally represented language in a highly creative way, constrained by its rules but free to express new thoughts that relate to past experience or present sensation only in a remote and abstract fashion. If this is correct, and I think it is, if this is correct, then there's no hope at all in the study of control of human behavior by stimulus conditions, by schedules of reinforcement, by the establishment of habit structures and patterns of behavior, and so on. Of course, one can design a restricted environment in which such control and such patterns can be demonstrated. But there's no reason to suppose that any more is learned about the range of human potentialities by such methods than would be learned by observing humans in a prison or in an army or in many a schoolroom, for that example. The essential properties of the human mind will always escape such investigation. And if I can be pardoned the final non-professional comment, I'm very happy with this outcome. Thank you. of a second language without living in the country where the language is spoken? If not, are we wasting time and energy in trying to teach foreign languages in our schools and colleges uh, today? Well, I think the answer to the second question is yes, we are wasting plenty of time and energy in trying to teach foreign languages in our schools and colleges today, but not because the answer to the first question is yes, if you can follow that. That is, it does seem to me perfectly possible to learn a good deal about a second language without living in the country where the language is spoken. And I don't even think this is a controversial issue because there are plenty of positive instances. Plenty of people have succeeded in learning a great deal, gaining real fluency and the real understanding of a second language by study. So we know that the answer is it can be done. But we don't know how it's done. And I think the methods of teaching second language that are used are at best neutral and at worst uh, harmful to, the, to this process. I think the most we know about teaching second languages is that the student should be presented with interesting material, material that he finds interesting. He should be presented with a motivation for studying that is enough. And he should be presented with varied and complicated materials that are not so complicated that he, that, that he can't work with them and not so simple that they'll bore him to tears. Now, the older methods of teaching language, I mean, to oversimplify, I think made the first mistake. They, they tended to provide materials that were too unstructured and too complicated for people to be able to deal with. But the so-called linguistic method, which in my opinion is a catastrophe, has 
simplified the materials down to a memor you know to memorization of patterns. Those of you who are either studying language or in school or teaching it are perfectly familiar with this stuff. And it's done this on the basis of a theory of language and a theory of mind, which is just wrong. The theory is just wrong, so it would be a miracle if the methods worked. The theory is that language behavior is a matter of habits uh, and patterns. And therefore, if you want to train people to know a second language, you teach them habits and patterns. But the assumption is wrong, and the methodology simply has the effect of boring people to tears, quite naturally. And therefore, I think it should be thrown out. It doesn't give them enough stimulation, enough complexity, and enough diversity so that the student can make use of whatever it is that enables people to learn things, and we don't know what that is, on materials that are interesting enough to engage him. Now, you know, that's not very helpful to the language teacher, I don't think, but it seems to me that that is about all that one can say from a, uh, if you want, scientific point of view, quasi-scientific point of view, or maybe pseudo-scientific point of view about, about this issue. So I think, obviously, we can teach languages. It is often done by good teachers and motivated students, but the methods that are uh, suggested are, I think, very, very, very questionable, and I should think that any teacher should have the good sense to certainly think about them, but probably to reject them. To what extent do you reject the tabula rasa theory? How much and to what degree is intuitive knowledge present in humans? Well, I don't think that anybody can accept a tabula rasa theory in any serious way. Uh, Locke didn't accept it, and Hume didn't accept it, really. Uh, what the question is, I think, what properties are we, if we want to study the way a scientist would study the problem of acquisition of knowledge, we ask the question, what information is presented to the organism and what does he come up with? What's the initial and the final state of this device? And clearly the device must have certain specific given structure if it's going to go in anything but a random way from one final state, to, from a given final state to initial state to a given final state. If many such devices, many different people do it in a comparable fashion, then there must be initial structure in the, in the organism. That's not even in question. The question is, what is the initial structure? And here I think there have been two divergent points of view that you can roughly characterize. One is the point of view that what's intrinsic to the device, to the mind, if you like, is a set of procedures for acquiring knowledge. So Hume, in fact, enumerated these procedures. He said there's three methods of building up associations on the basis of similarity and contiguity and cause and effect relation, the latter in in incidentally being ultimately an animal instinct, according to Hume, analogous to the instinct that enables birds to build nests. Now this is sort of a pure empiricism. It says that all there is in the brain is in the mind is a set of me intrinsic mechanisms for making associations on the basis of s similarity, contiguity, and cause-effect relation. And then there was this matter of secondary impressions, which sort of comes in in the second volume and nobody knows what to do with. But without that, that's the first, uh, you know, that's a kind of a sharp empiricism. And that's the kind of view that's held by a lot of modern philosophers. I mean, it's almost the, you might almost say the standard view among people who think of themselves as hard-headed. I, and I just don't think that, from a purely scientific point of view, that that is what is in, that we can say that that is what is intrinsic to the mind. Now, there's a very different point of view, which is much more characteristic of rationalist philosophy, and here I think is its great insight and its great merit, which argues that what is intrinsic to the mind is certain properties of the resulting knowledge. Maybe not the resulting knowledge in detail, but certain forms that it takes, certain properties that it has certain general ways in which it's constructed in relation and, and related in its various subcomponents, if you like. These things are all intrinsic to the mind. And I think that the study of language lends a good deal of support to that. I don't see any way of accounting for the fact that languages, if it is a fact, that languages always have deep and surface structure related by these very peculiar operations called grammatical transformations, meeting a whole bunch of funny conditions, which I haven't bothered stating, but that can be stated. I don't see any way of accounting for the fact that the final state of the device always has these properties, unless we assume that those properties characterize the device itself. There's no way of building up those properties by induction or by association. They don't arise out of the data from some operation. You could think of millions of different 
theories compatible with the data that are entirely different from this. And uh, this seems to me the sort of basic rationalist insight. And in this respect, I think that the, ration, the much derided rationalist philosophers were really taking a far more scientific view of the whole matter than their empiricist counterparts, who were, as, like Hume, who were simply stipulating absolutely dogmatically, as Skinner stipulates, as Klein stipulates, and many others do, just as an article of faith, that there are certain fixed properties of the mind, namely the ability to form associations, et cetera, et cetera, and we don't care what the evidence is. We just know by a kind of sort of, I don't know what, mystical insight is what I think it is, that these are the properties of the mind. Now, I don't think any scientist or engineer, let's say, would study the question by making any such, such assumption. He would look at the input-output relations and try to determine from them what are the properties of the mind. And in this respect, I think the whole empiricist tradition, and I would include modern psychology almost, well, you know, I don't want to overgeneralize, but certainly most of behaviorism as a subpart of it, has simply been based on a dogmatic stipulation which doesn't stand up, as why should it, against factual investigation. So and th this is the way I would like to reinterpret the tabula rasa question. In referring to the sentences of the chimpanzee, I can understand how that might have been only a series of events, but is not the expression of a series of events intimately related to the expression of causal relationships? And isn't that type of expression a forerunner of creative speculation and connected ideas? Yeah, I think that I don't doubt that a chimpanzee is capable of, under, of, of seeing a relation between successive events, let's say. In fact, I suppose that down very low on the phyletic orders, if you like, you'll find the ability to relate successive events and to learn cause-effect relationships and so on. I mean, wherever you can do any training, this is presupposed. So in this respect, something analogous to thinking is present very low down. I mean, you know, down to the level of the earthworm, if you believe some psychologists, and maybe all the way down. Maybe it's a property of organic matter, you know. But uh, it doesn't seem to me that that is enough to say that it's enough to say that this is a forerunner of thought, because human thought is not simply a matter of concatenating consecutive and ex uh, events that are ex expected to be related by cause-effect relationships. So it has other properties. For example, it has the properties that I described, and many others that we can't even begin to describe. And it seems to me that there's no there's nothing learned by the, there's no sense to the assertion that. One of it, does, it seems to me that, well, let me use an example of Eric Lenneberg's, that you might just as well say that speaking derives from walking. You know? There are many things that speaking and walking have in common, surely. I mean, you know, so, but might, would you then say that speaking derives from walking? Is walking a forerunner of speaking? Well, no, you know, doesn't, not in any serious sense. Until you can account for the specific properties of human thought, of human cognitive structures, and show how those arose, specifically from some other specific thing, you haven't done anything. The otherwise, you're just talking about vague analogies between different kinds of intelligence, which may have something to do with each other, but may not. Within the constraints of your philosophy, to dignify it, how would you define intelligence? Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> Uh, it seems to me that it, I don't know. I really don't know the answer to that question. I think we'll know the answer. Let me just say, how, how, could one, how could one proceed to define intelligence? I think you could do it by trying to develop an understanding of the products of intelligence and the acts of intelligence. So by studying human language, you're making some sort of an inroad into a definition of intelligence. If you could investigate how people find answers to complicated problems, if you knew the, if you could study that and say something serious about it, you would have made another contribution to the study of intelligence, and so on. Maybe someday somebody will be able to develop a kind of an overarching theory of human cognitive structure that will account that will deal with all of these things. But it seems to me we're so far from this that any attempt to define it will just be some platitude, but and very useless. When you do one transformation on the blackboard showing the difference between surface and deep structure? Well, uh, let me give the, just the example that I, I think you can probably hear me without the microphone. Uh, let me just sketch out the one example that I talked about, which is perfectly characteristic. If we take the sentence, 
John, well, let me write it down here. John is certain to leave. Uh, what will its surface structure be? Well, it will be a breakdown into certain phrases like this one uh, and this one. And I think it's more revealing to represent these phrases in a tree-like form. So let's say that the phrase to leave is a verb phrase, which I'll designate like that, and that certain to leave, or maybe is certain to leave, is another verb phrase, which I'll designate like this. So the phrase is certain to leave includes the phrase to leave, both of them being verb phrases. And the phrase John is, let's say, a noun phrase, and the whole thing is a proposition or a sentence. We might represent the surface structure of the sentence by a structure of that sort, a labeled tree diagram or labeled bracketing, if you like. On the other hand, the deep structure of this sentence is going to have to say what? It's going to have to say that the subject-predicate relation, which is, after all, just the relation stated by this configuration of a subject, a predicate, related as a proposition, we're going to have to say that that configuration holds, so let's write down the configuration, holds of the, of the proposition that John leaves. So down here we have a proposition sentence, and here we have something that we're predicating of that proposition, namely that it is certain. The proposition itself, again, has a subject and predicate. The predicate subject being John, the predicate being Lee. So we have the subject predicate configuration holding of John leaves. We have the subject predicate configuration holding of the proposition that John leaves and the logical property of certainty. And that's something like that would be the deep structure. That is, this formulation would express the fact that we are predicating the logical property of certainty of the proposition that John leaves when we say John is certain to leave. And the phrasing of that thing, if we break this down into its physical parts, it of course expresses nothing of the kind. On the other hand, John is certain that Bill will leave will, as I've said, be both the deep and surface structure. Now, to relate these two things, one needs certain formal operations. Each of these is a formal, if you want, mathematical structure, sorry, which we could, you know, which we could describe in perfectly formal terms. And we know how to understand, we, we sort of understand the problem of how to, for, how to discuss structures of that sort and how to think of formal operations that map one onto the other. The operations will have to do various things to the tree structures and interrelate them and replace parts and so on and so forth. Now, there is no sort of given branch of mathematics that deals with this problem. And the reason for that is, is in itself rather interesting. The reason that there is no developed mathematics dealing with the formal operations that relate to structures of that kind is that this whole problem is much too complicated to, for any sort of rational mathematician to look at. Mathematicians might be very interested in studying what you might call uh, structure-free operations on strings. See, mathematicians might be quite interested in studying what, what happens if you have a sequence of words like John is certain to leave, and let's say you read it from back to front, or you interchange the second word with the fifth word, or you carry out operations of that sort. In fact, there's a whole class of formal operations that you might call structure-independent operations that just relate to the word itself. And it's a very striking and very important fact, part of the design of language, if you like, that there aren't any such operations in human language. No operation that any mathematician in his right mind would consider is an operation of human language. The actual operations of human language are structure-dependent operations, operations which deal not only with those sequences of words, but to deal with them by virtue of the ways in which they are grouped so, for example, there's in English, if you wanted to form a question, if you wanted to relate those two things, you would have to deal not only with the words, but with the ways in which they're grouped. Or if you want to form a question in English, you have to take, suppose I want to form a question from uh, the man I saw is certain to leave. I have to deal with a group of words and interchange it in some fashion and say, is the man I saw certain to leave? I can't form, a, there is no language in which you form a question by a much simpler operation, namely say, taking the sentence, the man I saw is certain to leave, and reading it backwards, which I can't even do. But that mathematically trivial operation of reflection, of reading something backwards, 
is an operation that doesn't exist in any human language. On the other hand, the operation of dealing with structures of this sort, with phrases by virtue of the way they're, by, by, of elements by virtue of the way they're grouped and so on, what you might call formally structure-dependent operations of the kind that would relate those two formal objects, that is characteristic of human language. Now, if one really wants to be serious about talking about the design of language, then it's points of this kind that are critical. The fact that language involves structure-dependent operations and no structure-independent operations, that's a more or less deep property of human language. And uh, uh, it's not, you can't explain this property on grounds of, let's say, simplicity or utility or anything of that sort. Quite the contrary. If, you, if the notion of general simplicity means anything, Structure-dependent operations are far more complex and intricate than structure-independent ones. But nevertheless, those are the kind of relations that one has in human language. And that's a very non-trivial fact. It's a very non-trivial fact that no human language can form questions by, by reading the sentence backwards or by taking the fifth word and putting it to the left or something of that sort, which would be a very simple elementary operation. These are real properties of the design of language. I don't know if that answers the question be the last one then. You seem now to be saying that the native speaker has competence to judge the appropriateness of particular sentences of a particular sentence in a sequence of sentences. Doesn't this mean that the linguist will have to deal with structures above the sentence level in order to explain the form and meaning of natural language? Uh, ultimately, I think yes. And this is the point I was trying to drive at in talking uh, to drive at in talking about the, uh, in, in talking of this abstraction. So far, the study of language has been constrained to the study of formal structures, for example, of the kind I've written on the board, and the formal operations that relate them. As soon as we try to ask what makes a sentence appropriate in a certain context, why is it appropriate for me to say what I'm now saying, but not any one of an infinite number of other sentences, then we enter into a range of considerations where the intellectual tools that enable us to talk about formal structures and the relations between them just don't do any work. And we're stuck because we don't have any other intellectual tools. So I think certainly that linguists, in a sense, will have to study the, way, the question of appropriateness, the question of what makes it proper to use a sentence with a particular sound and a particular meaning in, a, in some given situation, but I just don't think that anybody has the tools to deal with that question. Or to put it more precisely, nobody can formulate a sub-part of that question in an intelligible fashion. And until we can not only formulate some part of that question in an intelligible fashion, but also answer it, until we can do that, we're not going to understand anything about the normal creative use of language, which is not just a matter of relating an infinite number of sounds to an infinite number of meanings, but is also a matter of being able to pick the right pairing out in appropriately to some situation, where appropriately to a situation does not mean, and here's where I think all of the attempts in modern psychology to deal with this fall apart, it does not mean control of the response by the stimuli. Control by the stimuli is one thing, appropriateness of a response to a situation is a different thing. I mean, it both, in, both involve responses and stimuli, but one, you know, maybe we can study the relation of responses to controlling stimuli, but the study of the relation of responses to situations that makes them appropriate, that's an entirely different study. And in fact, the place where the whole theory of verbal behavior completely just m misses reality is in its attempt to, t to tie these two things together. As far as we know, they have nothing to do with one another. And it's the study of appropriateness of utterances and situations that, that is, you know, the, the real, the, it, unless we, until we begin to study that, we won't be talking about the normal creative aspect of language use. And frankly, I don't see any way to predict whether we ever, whether we will be able to talk about that. At the moment, I think that all that anybody can honestly say is that we don't understand a thing about that problem. Are there some people here who have no place to stay for the night? If so, will you please raise your hand? You're asked to go to the dining room, to the north end of the dining room, so you're not absorbed with the others. <laughs>
And then there is a, an offer here by Mr. H. Gordon, who is at the Nicollet Hotel and who will be here at the lectern after the meeting, who has a, double ro a room with a double bed and with room for a rollaway bed. And uh, he says he'd be happy to work out rooming for someone, but um, um, men only, dang it. <laughs> All right, uh, tomorrow at 10 o'clock, again at 1.30 when Dr. Lenneberg, and then the panel at 3.30 at, uh, in the afternoon. <laughs>